Good morning. Good morning. The, uh, it is an absolute honor to be here today. The, uh, I would like to start off with thanking FCA, General Chaser, General Wood, Mike, I can't, I'm not quite sure where you're at, but thank you for putting all this on into the Cyber Center of Excellence. Uh, I know what a heavy lift this is, the, uh, and I really just appreciate everybody bringing this great community together so that we can have a week of dialogue and discussions. I think these sessions are so important. And it is, um, I, I think it's absolutely critical, quite frankly, because I do believe that our Army and our nation are at an inflection point. And the opportunities that come with challenges are right in front of us. But it's all if we seize it together. And so that is what I really want to convey to you. And I'm going to talk for just a few minutes, and then what I'd really like to do is open it up for questions. Uh, please don't leave me hanging, because we've got an hour, and it will be very awkward, because I will not leave this stage. I will stay here the entire hour, and I will blind you with the reflection off of my forehead. So I really do want to get to the dialogue piece, but, but I want to hit on a couple things that uh, General Stanton and General Martin talked about. Because I'm going to throw a thesis out to you. Everything that operationally the General Stanton laid out will not happen without a unified network. It simply will not happen. It is a pipe dream. And everybody knows that you can have the best doctrine in the world, but if you don't underpin it with that science that Paul was talking about, the notion of multi-domain operations at the speed, tempo, and violence that we envision will not become a reality. We will not be able to compete during competition, crisis, nor conflict unless we get after this notion of a unified network. And I want to sort of describe what this notion is because it really is just a shift in our thinking. I don't think it is this monolithic thing. Matter of fact, I will submit to you it's not a thing at all. It's an operational framework. But I want to start with this notion of multi-domain operations, or in the joint world, joint all-domain operations. How many have read the Chief's white paper on multi-domain operations? I would highly recommend that everybody start with it. Because everything that we do in the cyber domain must start with what are we trying to enable from an operational perspective. And the chief throws out several notions about what multi-domain operations is. And I'm just going to give you some of his basic tenet. It's this notion of inside and outside forces. Operating inside the enemy's A2 AD bubble, their anti-access aerial denial capabilities, of which some of our near peers have built significant capabilities. But being able to operate inside that so you can gain contact and either employ kinetic or non-kinetic fires. That notion of outside, that we need to be globally connected because it will be a contested battle space, not to a specific theater, but globally. Just look at some of the capabilities that our adversaries have well outside the normal theater of operations. It will be contested globally. CONUS no longer being sanctuary. It will be contested from the time we try to drive out of the motor pool to get to a port. Just look at the recent intrusions on U.S. infrastructure. The threat is real. So this notion of inside and outside, all globally connected, this notion of strategic, operational, and tactical effects being delivered at the timing and tempo of the maneuver commander's choosing. Strategic effects, deep sensing, long-range precision fires. If you're going to fire artillery from hundreds or thousands of miles away, that is not going to happen on solely a BCT-centric tactical network. It will not happen. Cyber effects. You will hear General Fogarty talk about the operations that Army Cyber is conducting daily. 
That is not happening from being at the tactical edge. Yet, he can probably give you numerous examples of those strategic effects that are being applied in a tactical battle space. So this binding of strategic, operational, and tactical effects, this notion of inside and outside forces, all to achieve two things. To be able to operate at range, think of the extended distances, think global, and speed which ties back into the information advantage components of what General Stanton was talking about, to achieve decision dominance over any adversary. To see, understand, and most importantly, act off of the right information at the right time at the right location is decision dominance. So if you start with that premise, that that is the Army's transformation of multi-domain operations. How in the world do you get there with bifurcated modernization efforts when it comes to the network? Now the network CFT has done tremendous things getting the tactical network on track. But it's still very brigade combat team focused. You heard General Martin talk about the division of the Waypoint Force of 2027-2028. It's about division and core maneuver. It's about making those two echelons the unit of action. And right now, we're not postured from a network perspective to bring that together. It's about aligning modernization at the enterprise level so that you can apply those strategic and operational effects. That is what we need to drive towards. So, I will tell you, there's a way that we can get after this. So first off, we need to set the unified network so we can enable multi-domain operations. It starts with step one, optimizing the network that we have. We have spent a lot of money on network modernization, operations, maintenance, and security. I will submit to you, we have not been near as efficient with those investments as we've needed to and therefore we've made ourselves less effective. But by aligning our investments and op optimizing the network that we have, we can make a lot of progress that General Merritt can articulate to you when she speaks tomorrow. I'm, I'm passing the buck to you on that one, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I'm being facetious. I'm more willing to take questions on it. But we can make a lot of money. But it's also, number two, aligning our tactical and our enterprise modernization efforts so we are linking it all the way across. We do not have a coherent modernization strategy, or excuse me, plan, I think we have a strategy, for our mission networks writ large, whether that's US Secret, whether that's RTS, or whether that's SecRel. Yet those are the networks we will be fighting on. Yet we have spent the vast majority of the last seven, eight years very, very focused on installation modernization, primarily on Nippernet, and on BCT modernization over here. We need to bring those two together. And it all starts with that optimization and then establishing an alignment between the modernization efforts and then nesting security all the way across it based off of zero trust principles. And all of this must be done in a coalition and joint context. And by doing that, you'll get after the things that you heard General Stan talk about. You will start to see information advantage become operationalized. You will get to see the Army transform to a multi-domain capable force in 2027 or 2028. Because I will submit to you, unless we get this notion of a unified network right, we won't get to where the chief wants us to be in the 2027, 2028 timeframe. And you're seeing that recognition from Army senior leaders because now they're saying one of the primary objectives of getting to that multi-demand capable force is a fully modernized and integrated warfighting network. I call it the unified network. 
G3 wants to call it the Warfighting Network. It is all the same operational concept. That's being able to conduct multi-domain operations at speed, at the tempo of the maneuver commander's choosing. And you're going to start seeing, to our industry partners, a fairly significant shift starting in 22 of how the Army's aligning its investments. Quite frankly, if you haven't already started to see it. And we are going to start focusing on making sure that we do that alignment between our tactical network modernization efforts and our enterprise modernization efforts. You're going to see us making the investments and optimizing the network that we have. You're going to see us divesting of legacy capabilities that we no longer need, which is shocking how much stuff the Army holds on to. But the reality of it is, is with the fiscal environment that we're in, and with the fiscal challenges that comes with it, presents a great opportunity for us to optimize and harmonize our investments. And so a great deal of work is going into that. But, but the notion of this unified network, based off zero trust principles, with a security architecture that is integrated both at the enterprise, re strategic and operational, and the tactical levels, leads us to the third thing that we must do. And that is align our force structure and place complexity at the right echelons. I'll give you an anecdote. There needs to be some level of defensive cyber capabilities inside a BCT. But that should not be where our principal investment in personnel should be. We want our brigade combat teams maneuvering. If the division's gonna be the unit of action, raise that complexity up. Focus it there. Let the divisions just plug in to what the division is doing and let the divisions play Overwatch. And that's just at the tactical level. We need this notion of a do-not framework that is global in nature that really brings that all the way up to everything that the Army Do Not Center out at NETCOM and our cyber is getting after. Now, we're in the midst of getting after that most important piece because the, the technical piece of this is relatively straightforward. The people piece and getting that organizational design component of it is really the toughest and the most important pieces of it. And so when we did the Expeditionary Signal Battalion Enhanced a couple years ago, everybody thought that was the big idea. It wasn't. It was really to reinvest those people in that do not framework globally that I just sort of described. Starting with our cyber and netcom, reinforcing the regional cyber centers, and pushing it out and transforming our uh, theater tactical signal brigades and the core signal brigades, and then reinforcing our strategic signal brigades. I can only tell you we probably got it about partially right. And we do have the folks moving. What we need to do now is based off of operations over the last three or four years is go back in and revisit that and make sure that we've got the organizational design the correct way that really gets after this notion of a global unified network and then how do you operate, maintain, secure, and perhaps most importantly, maneuver it in support of multi-domain operations. So, setting an architecture, setting people in organizational design, the last component of it is you've got to give them unifying capabilities. And this is where we need industry's help. So the Army now, for the very first time, has a unifying net ops capability requirement document. Enterprise, again, strategic and operational, and tactical. One requirement to get after this notion of a unified network. Integrated capabilities that we build from the edge back that can scale, that allow us to see ourselves, allow us to operate, maintain, secure, defend, and maneuver the network where you have the same look and feel no matter which echelon you're at, 
so that I can take a signal leader or a cyber operator and I can put them into any command post or talk and they see the exact same thing. And it's integrated. So this notion of the cop that General Stanton, that buzzword he's been chasing, is actually something that you can see. So we align architecture, we align people, we align organizational construct, and you align capabilities. And that needs to be our real push to get after this notion of a unified network. That will be what enables us to conduct multi-domain operations at speed. And quite frankly, we conduct multi-domain operations today. It just doesn't happen at the timing, speed, and tempo that we will need in a future fight. And so, I'm excited for the future. I think we have senior leaders who clearly understand the need for change. And while certainly there are many, many challenges that are presented to our Army, I think there are equally, if not even more, opportunities in front of us. But we need your help as we work our way through this notion of unified net ops capabilities. And we need your help thinking through how can we take complexity out of our lower formations and raise it up to an appropriate echelon. And we need your help making sure that the capabilities are integrated. They are not stovepiped. They're not one-off. So that we're making, quite frankly, the folks that are out on the battlefield work harder, not smarter. We need to go the opposite direction. And so with that, the, uh, I do appreciate all the time. This is where we're going to assume risk. You're either going to look at my bald head the next 40 minutes, the, uh, or we can have a great dialogue. And I really look forward to your questions. Again, thank you. Yes, sir. So what is the technical arm that is going to ensure that you've got the interoperability, the standards across all the services and the coalition partners to include uh, the enforcement of those standards? So that's a great question, sir. I'm going to take it from an Army perspective first, and then I'll back it into the joint piece, and I'm sure Rob Parker can bang on a little bit more if he does his part, or General Carl, rather. The, uh, so, from an Army perspective, right now, it is getting our community aligned. And I hope one of the messages that you all take away from this conference is you're going to hear a pretty straightforward and consistent message from all the senior leaders who will stand up here. And it's, and it's not by design. I can promise you we haven't been sharing our notes. But what we have been doing is working very, very closely, bringing the team together so we all have a common understanding and vision of where we need to head. And so that, that, that's the first piece of it. But it is establishing who is going to be the lead, for example, uh, Unified Net Ops. What acquisition PEO is going to be responsible for that? And if we are going to keep it separated, how do we apply the appropriate governance over the top of it? That, that is a task that's been given to us from the vice to work with the ASOL community to, to sort through how that is. But it'll be one of the two. But there's another very, very important component of that, and that's making sure that we have the operational command knee deep in it. And that comes from two places, our cyber, from a broader enterprise perspective, but also we've got to bring in Forcecom, user pack, and user so that they are playing an infinite piece of this. Because the churn that we really want to get into the system is the operator, the operator pressure. That, that is what's going to be what really drives us along so that we can be judging ourselves and meeting operational requirements and getting that operator feedback early and often as we go through this. And so that, that's the Army perspective of how we're building this out. Now, to, to that point, uh, the Army Unified Network Plan is in its final throes of staffing. Um, it has gone through my level. It's going to be making its way up to the front offices with a detailed implementation plan that's going to be codified in the next order because we're going to treat this like an operation. And we are going to spend 
uh, pen very specific responsibilities on specific organizations with specific timelines and then hold ourselves accountable through traditional army processes, not through some separate network governance. That's, that's mildly interesting if all the communicators and the cyber folks get into a room and talk about what we're doing. The key is getting it into operational channels so senior leaders are routinely understanding it. That's the Army perspective. The um, JAD C2 uh, cross-functional team being led by Rob Parker up on the joint staff is really the body that's pulling together the services to bring all that together. Now, that's a building process but I will tell you it's morphing out into the broader community. What I will also tell you is at the service level, there is a ton of cooperation going on, uh, specifically between the Air Force and, and the Army, where our Chiefs of Staff have signed out documents and said this is the way that we are gonna start to build out this broader notion of a unified network and push those lessons learned up to the Joint Staff so that we are informing them. And so we, we've actually brought the Navy into it. Admiral Gilday attended the last US uh, Army and Air Force talks. So now we're getting that broader coalition going. But again, the Joint Staff's in the room with us as we're actually building out capabilities like the Joint Systems Integration Lab up at APG, which is designed specifically to link all the service battle labs together so that we are informing ourselves. The end state of what I think the CFT, and Rob, correct me if I'm wrong, is going to be the data standards that allow us to really drive this interoperability across the joint force. I'll, I'll let you chime in. Yes, sir. Uh, right in line with everything you're saying, for the group I'll be speaking tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock in more in depth on this, three key areas. We have the JET C2 reference architecture as part of the combined effort of the stakeholders, the Army, the other services, combatant command, we've had chief data officers uh, from all those organizations working with us for about the past seven or eight months to bring this together. The important piece to Colonel Shea's question about where's the enforcement mechanism, that's in the governance of the JAD C2 strategy and the CFT. Everything we're doing is taken through the JROC uh, and the WARS uh, by the service vices, and then from there it goes to the deputy sec def for the DBAC to decide the resourcing pieces of that. So we've got both the, the requirements, capabilities piece, and we've got the resourcing there to help start binding this together. Final piece, our coalition, allies, five guys, partners, others uh, from DOD and outside the department are all part of our, our stakeholder group in the CFP. So more to follow tomorrow. All right, can, I ask, can I ask a follow-on question? Sure. It's our only one. <laughs> how is the intelligence community, like DIA, NGA, and all those, how how heavily engaged? There, that's where many of the sensors are. How are they integrating, and are they being integrated into They're the in process? They're in the CFP as well. Sir. Pardon? They're in the, the cross-functional team. Yeah. The and on many levels quite frankly, because you're right. You know, th this is all about combined arms maneuver inside the cyber domain, right? And everybody's got to play. Signal's got to operate, maintain, defend, and maneuver. The cyber forces obviously have to defense mission. Uh, we've got EW that's now going out into, um, uh, out into the battle space. Intel underpins all three of those. And so, I, I will tell you, almost weekly collaboration with General Potter inside the G2 shop. Um, a very, very tight G26 relationship because uh, everything that we're doing needs to be threat informed on how we are building stuff out. And, and quite frankly, you know, significant efforts inside the Army to make sure that we are looking forward on our modernization efforts so we are putting the right controls in place to protect our modernization and make sure that we are not tipping everything that we are trying to accomplish uh, to our um, potential adversaries. Can I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll be reading our questions here from the back. Thank you to all of our attendees who have submitted questions so far. We still have plenty of time, so continue to uh, submit your questions to the address on your screen. 
So the first question from, uh, from the AV table is, uh, could you describe the progress of integrating sensors across the joint force, and how can industry help? So I would tell you, and this is um, probably from as much my last job as this, this job, Tremendous progress made by Joint Force Headquarters over the last 24 months. And quite frankly, a lot of that under the great leadership of Paul Friedenberg. Uh, the, and so we have a, an ability to see ourselves like we have never, ever seen before. Now, there, there is still a wicked C2 problem as you look at the entire DOD enterprise with the 42 different uh, areas of operation within inside the DOD. From an Army perspective, I feel very comfortable where we are. Uh, we will be making some decisions here over the next several months about how we are going to integrate sensors that are both at the tactical edge and, again, up at the enterprise or strategic or operational levels so that we, again, we're getting after this sense of commonality so that we can see ourselves and, more importantly, that we can feed that information up so we can actually secure the network appropriately in a contested and contested environment. And so I feel pretty comfortable with what we are putting into place. Read on the networks that Army Cyber and NETCOM are actually operating, maintaining, and defending. I do think, uh, and it's one of the main things that we're working to get after over the, the next couple years, the uh, organizational nets that are outside of that C2 umbrella. We probably have some work to do there with commonality and making sure that we've got common TTPs and common reporting so we've got that common visibility that's flowing back into net common Army Cyber. We are nested uh, with the Joint Force even though we are using different capabilities. But one of the things that we work very closely with Joint Force Headquarters Doden was making sure that we had those data flows automated flowing into their larger database so that they could see everything that we were seeing and provide that additional overwatch over uh, the Army networks just like Joint Force Headquarters is supposed to be doing. Where can industry help? It's that last piece that I just mentioned. That integration portion of it ended up falling back onto a bunch of Army folks to try and figure out and work with Joint Force Headquarters to, again, Standalone stovepipe tools that don't allow us to integrate across the entire Department of Defense. Interesting, not relevant. Even if they're the greatest thing in the world. Where we need help is making sure that whatever we use to operate, maintain, and secure and defend the network, we can integrate it, not only with inside the Army, but across the broader joint force. It also needs to operate at the edge, as well as it operates on some installation here in Conus. That, that is where we need your help. I can't bang on that one enough. Thanks for the question. I hope I answered it. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the next question, um, you mentioned that unif the unified network will follow traditional Army rollout. Um, are there any, uh, any, is there anything in place to ensure that we don't fall into the old drawn out acquisition process? <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you a couple, couple thoughts. Um, so one is this notion of optimize, which is really allowing us to do modernization of our network, but at a much faster speed. I mean, and those were quite frankly being almost exclusively led by Netcom and just taking capabilities that they have today with funds that get allocated by Big Army and then making critical changes to the network that actually allow us to deploy uh, from CONUS and go overseas and you're able to actually just plug into the network. And as everybody in this room knows, that traditionally has been a big challenge. But that's all about this notion of optimization. That, that's one piece. But, but I think the biggest tell is the way that we're approaching requirements. I mean, these IT boxes, and you know, I just sat into the update to the device the other day. This, this developing a three to five year program with funding thresholds that keep it down at the lower ACAT levels that allow you to sit there and field capabilities and then iteratively build off of them. 
I will tell you that has really helped the Army. And so whether it's the DCO capabilities and that IT box that was established you know, four or five years ago to the unified net ops, ISICD, say that one three times fast. <laughs> but to that portion of it, it is three, five years spring to get capabilities out there and then we go back in and we revalidate the requirements as the truth changes. And in this space, the truth changes really rapidly. You, you might have noticed I haven't talked about the aim point force of 2035 because I have no idea what technology is going to look like in 2035. Y'all can help us with that. I, but I, I've got zero clue. But 2028, 20, 27? I think we've got a fairly decent idea of what's in the yard of the possible. And so this notion of these IT boxes where you set basic parameters for what the requirements are that are not gold-plated, that allow you to get capability into the hands of our soldiers, and then improve the requirement and the capability over the course of time, they're proven very, very successful. We started leveraging it uh, from uh, the cyber world where we did it for both offensive and defensive capabilities and training capabilities. And now we're morphing it into the broader network perspective. Hence why I'm so excited about finally having a unifying requirements document that drives Army processes uh, that is for network operations exclusively. And so I, I think that is a game changer. And then quite frankly, it allows us to maybe not keep pace with industry, but boy, we can sure start riding coattails and do it in much faster sprints and much more iteratively. Now, would that answer your question? Thank you, sir. The next audience question. With the Army's adoption of cloud collaboration environments, the ability to create workspaces and data has been democratized in a way the Army hasn't seen before. What strategies or policy are being created to ensure that knowledge and data created at the edge makes it back to the enterprise for broader use and doesn't remain siloed? I'm gonna flip your question around a little bit, if, if I may, um, because quite frankly, from the edge back, we don't have that answer yet, but, but I'll explain how we're gonna start getting after it so we can inform ourselves uh, moving forward. I think the broader question though is as we move to capabilities like Army 365, you know, software as a service, allowing us to actually leverage a cloud environment across the broader enterprise has really set the foundation for us to move at a pretty good clip towards this notion of zero trust that General Stanton laid out. And it has been a game changer from a couple different perspectives. Not only did it build off of commercial virtual remote CBR that we put in place very rapidly due to the pandemic, that was one component of it, and it certainly helped with telework, et cetera. But it's the other side that's really been the game changer. And it is this notion of proving to ourselves we can take stuff off-prem, we don't need to hug our servers. And I know General Warren's stealing that phrase from her. You know, we can take stuff off-prem and we can actually put things into the cloud, we can put it in, a, in there in a secure manner, and we can trust it. And just that notion alone of proving it to ourselves at, at, at really a, a rapid clip when we made the decision to go to Army 365, it was April, and in place in June, again, treated like an operation. I think that component of it alone is laying down the foundation that as we move to the cloud, we now have the processes in place to understand how to put a security wrapper around it. Because putting stuff in the cloud is interesting. Gotta be able to secure it. But it also sets that foundation for us to put zero trust in all the way down uh, across our formations. So that, that's one piece. The second piece is this notion of divestment. You know, so when you take a look at the collaboration capabilities that we have across our Army, pretty significant. This transition allowed ourselves to become operationally more effective, but also fiscally a heck of a lot more efficient that then allowed us to go ahead and start buying down risk on some of those optimization 
uh, discussions that we were having. And so again, it, it's all about harmonizing our investments, aligning them appropriately between enterprise, and we're gonna keep banging on strategic and operational, and the tactical echelons. And it will allow us to go much faster, much deeper. Now, I know that's a little bit different than what you were asking. Now, this notion of tying it into the edge. We've done some, I would say at this point, initial experimentation and demonstration with cloud computing being pushed into tactical formations. We got senior leader decisions the other day that we are going to anchor our cloud efforts as we start trying to drive on this notion of ops and tail convergence over a unified network. We're gonna anchor our experimentation and demonstration in 22 and 23 to the multi-domain task force, tie it back into the enterprise efforts that are being led by the enterprise cloud management uh, activity, and then drive that pretty ruthlessly down into core and division. Now, it's a little different, and I realize I'm uh, talking a little bit out of both sides of my mouth, where I sit there and say, with unified net ops, we want to build from the edge back and make sure that it can scale. But in this case, to layer a data architecture based off of common data standards, it is more prudent to actually build the other direction. So again, we are building down towards the edge, so we don't inadvertently put the complexity too far down and we're able to manage it appropriately. All, all focus on being able to operate in a contested and congested environment. And so we will start that. Uh, we have a series of meetings this week, as a matter of fact, to start laying out what that detailed plan is for 22 and 23, so we can anchor to the investments we've already made in the multi-domain task force out at uh, Joint Place, Lewis McCord, and then tie that back into our enterprise efforts strategic and operational, though I can argue that the MDTF operates at the operation, and then drive that down into our tactical maneuver formations. And so you'll be seeing a lot more of that start to play out because the detailed planning is starting now. And again, all driven to inform what the JFC2 cross-functional team at the joint level is doing, and very closely tied to what our Air Force partners are doing. I hope that answers the question. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, you, you just mentioned JADC2. Uh, do you have any other thoughts on how the uh, how JADC2 will be shaping Army networking moder modernization or vice versa? So, so it's a two-way street. Um, I think General Martin mentioned it when the best ideas come from the bottom up, and certainly. Whenever you're dealing with something as complex as what JADC2 is, there needs to be a give and take that's both coming from the joint community, but it also needs to be informed by operational reality coming from the services, and most importantly, operational formations coming back up to feed that. And so there's a give and take that is ongoing. What I will tell you that I'm very impressed with is the transparency. And I'll give you two examples. So, when we did the um, Army Air Force Warfighter talks between the Chiefs up at APG a few months ago, the Joint Staff was invited. As a matter of fact, I believe General Parker was the rep that was sitting there. Hearing the open discussion, hearing what the service chiefs are saying, and being able to infuse the Joint perspective as well. I think that kind of transparency is absolutely critical. And so, I think there's gonna be some positive good uh, uh, give and take here. Now, what I will tell you is that give and take's also gotta go laterally. You know, and it, two weeks ago, sat in a session with General Brown, the Air Force Chief of Staff, as he was getting a back brief on where his data team and his architecture team were moving. And again, it's that lateral transparency as well. We're all gonna to have to give something to get to the joint operational concept that we all not only want, I would submit to you a need, it's an operational necessity. And so that transparency and that collaboration, I, I think is absolutely tantamount. But we also want to make sure that we're invoking, invoking maybe the wrong word, but the, uh, we are putting into the process that positive friction 
that makes us have those hard discussions. Yeah, and then we can, you know, meet where we're going to meet, and then we all need to move out smartly together. I hope that answered the question, sir. And Ron, I'm not taking offense to you walking out, sir. <laughs> Sir, so, so the next question, uh, the movement of complexity to the appropriate echelon is a good idea, but might lead to big data targets at core or higher levels accessible to new enemy attack capabilities. Uh, do you foresee this being a problem? You know, the, is it something that we need to work through? Uh, I, I actually had to get my thought on that one for a second. Is it something we need to work through? Sure. Um, and I think we will. And again, that learning by doing is going to be pretty key for us to be doing that so we can get that appropriate operational feedback because you really are op asking an operational question. Do I foresee it stopping the notion of putting complexity in the right place? Absolutely not. You know, it all comes down to how are we going to secure that and we have to bake the defensive capabilities into everything that we do. Uh, because quite frankly, the non-kinetic uh, capabilities of our adversaries are pretty good. Uh, and we just need to be cognizant of that as we are planning and working our way through where are we going to place that complexity. And, and like with anything, you always have a level of redundancy. My argument is not to sit there and say that we're not doing anything that is complex at the edge. My argument is let's do that those complex tasks that absolutely must be there and then smartly layer the more complex things up the chain of command for the folks that have the time to take a look at it. And a simple analogy, I've got a lot more time sitting in a regional cyber center to do hardcore data analytics against a very specific threat vector than you do in a BCT S6 shop that is maneuvering the content. Those are two completely different environments and the ability to sit there and actually think through that specific problem, I would submit to you at the edge, in a movement to contact, not gonna happen, right? Somebody else needs to be providing that defensive overwatch for that young major who's in that S6 shop and just as importantly, informing that maneuver commander if there's any risk to their operation. And so that's the notion that we need to get after. And then we'll do the right levels of the, both making sure that we secure our data. And then we have the applicable redundancy built into place so that we can, no matter what's happening on the battlefield, maintain operations at our timing and tempo. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next audience question. Strategic competition is occurring on civilian networks and platforms to gain information and strategic advantage. How are you thinking about force protection, data collection, and privacy, or data security, of our forces on external networks and platforms like social media? Wow, what a complex question. The, uh, I, I will tell you that uh, it, it is something that causes concern. You know, the, and, and we've all seen it. But I also think it all ties back to the, the, just the principles of operation security. And, and making sure that we have that realization that whatever our soldiers put out on social media or out in public, quite frankly, can have a direct tie back into what's happening operationally. So first and foremost, I, I do believe that there's a uh, education campaign that we just sort of need to reinvigorate, understanding that folks can go out there and they can put together a whole bunch of open source information and come up with a really, really good picture of what it is that we're thinking. The, uh, and, and that education process is starting to occur, probably not at the speed that we need it to, uh, but it, I, something that I do think that you're going to see the Army really start to pick up because there is a growing understanding of the threats that are posed by operating in an unclass world. You know, so you heard me say that we're going to make this shift on mission networks 
uh, starting in FY22, and we are. Matter of fact, I would submit to you that there's already been work on expanding some of those capabilities even now. You know? We have to transition a lot more of our daily operations away from the unclass network and onto our mission networks. Because our adversaries, I mean, they're just gobbling up all sorts of stuff on us through open source. And so that transition over to operating more and more in a classified environment is something that we will start doing through SIPR expansion, and that's really going to be the initial goal, is just to get more capabilities out there so we can protect the information we have out there with a real heavy emphasis on our modernization priorities, a really heavy focus on protecting our modernization priorities. And so for everybody in this room, it's going to be a little bit different environment as we mature our way through this because there's going to be um, a transition. I'm not going to say a lack of transparency by any stretch of imagination, but a different operating concept to where we will have to be doing a lot of the stuff that we're doing on higher nets. And that is just operationally prudent. And so that transition is just something that we have to get after. I hope that answered the question. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have uh, enough questions to keep you on stage all day. Uh, we're going to do two more. I know we have some admin uh, remarks here at the end. So uh, we'll, we'll do two more questions and, and let you get off the stage. But um, <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that. <laughs> uh, the penultimate question. Uh, could you provide some mentoring guidance to the younger soldiers on how and where to invest their time and effort in adapting to this unified network and MDO world? Yeah, you know, so, wow, that's a great question. So I, I'm going to start where, I'm just going to start where I sort of always start because it's comfortable. The number one thing is understand operationally where our army is headed. Understand what multi-domain operations is and is not. Understand and stay in tune as the concept continues to evolve. And, and that last piece is really, really key. Because you heard General Martin sort of subtly say it. You heard General Stanton sort of say it. Right now, it's an operational concept. Now, I would submit to you, we conduct op uh, multi-domain operations right now. But the operational concept is how do you do it at speed and velocity in a contested and congested environment. And so this operational concept is going to become doc a doctrine because we are doing it today. We absolutely are doing it today. But it is going to be unlike any other doctrine that we've had, I would submit to you, because the capabilities are just going to be so rapidly evolving that we need to be rapidly evolved. So what I would advise young officers is to think differently. This is not going to be like, you know, when I read Airland Battle, and I read it one time, and I was, OK, I got it. You know, in the next 20 years, that's just what we live. This is going to be different. It's going to be evolving. And we, meaning you, young officers, need to be evolving. And the second you start getting locked in uh, traditional thought, or you start thinking that you know everything, you need to like get yourself in the head. Because I can guarantee you something's changed out there and you need to adjust your thinking because the adversary sure is. That would be one. And then two would be do a lot of research on where industry and technologies are headed. The pay, you know, I, I would have told you that I thought the pace was unprecedented 10, 15 years ago, it's like really unprecedented now. And if you don't stay attuned to it, you will get up here, and General Stanton never uses buzzwords, but you will get up here and it will be a series of buzzwords as opposed to being informed so you can support that ever evolving operational concept. That would be the two bits of advice I would give the young officers. Uh, thank you, sir. One more question. How do we train and evaluate commanders and staffs on their execution of information advantage tasks? Yeah, the, I'll give you a thought, and then I'm really going to defer that to uh, General Stanton. 
because he's the one who's going to have to help CAC come up with that component of it. The, and, and the broad thought is really this. The, it's like anything else that we do when we train, right? There's a task, condition, and a standard. This one might be a little bit more nebulous, but we build it into everything that an organization is expected to do. It almost becomes a part of their mission essential task list. And that's the change that's got to happen. You know, how, how do you build this domain into readiness? If, if a weapon system is not patched appropriately, let's just go with a simple example. Well, there's a readiness issue there. So how do, you, how do we do that? You know, we're working our way through how that's gonna go, but my, my broader point too is you build it into what has made our Army so successful. And that is tying it back into how we've trained in the past. It's just a new, uh, I'm not even gonna say a new concept, it's an evolving concept, but it's not like we started yesterday to General Stanton's point. But we build that in and we measure ourselves. And as we put more and more capability in the SEMA sections and all that start to grow and mature, I think that portion of it's gonna get easier and easier and easier. I, I, what we need to make sure that we don't do, and this is a comment that was made about the network by um, by a leader, I'll just leave it to that. You know, the network is, it's, it's something that we can't see, we can't touch it. We don't really know if we're there or not. Well, same, same with information advantage. And what we want to make sure that we do is we take that, this invisible thing that's out there and turn it into something that's tangible that we can then measure against. And I would submit to you, I mean, everybody in this room has been a part of running a network. You, you know how to measure how the network's performing or not. We need to translate that so our operators completely understand that and then just build it into the traditional army processes. We know how to train formations. We know how to assess readiness. So by doing that, I think we take it out of this thing that is very, very soft and is sitting on a shelf and we worry about it during a warfighter and it gets inculcated into everything that a formation is doing on a day-to-day -day basis as they train and prepare to do whatever our nation asks them to do. Sorry about the long way to pontification at the last piece. <laughs> Thank you, sir, I, I lied. We do have one uh, final question there. There's one member of the audience who's- but, um, Before you do that, I yeah. wanna thank everybody for not letting me just stand up here and blind you with my ball. <laughs> One member of the audience is very eager to hear your thoughts on how the Dolphins are going to do this year. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, so nobody's going to like cheer me on when I say this, but I actually think we have a quarterback this year. You know, and as long as he stays healthy, I actually think that uh, now that the Patriots don't have Brady, I think we actually have a shot. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. We now ask uh, Lieutenant General Retired Bob Wood to come to the stage. Well, I'd like to thank a number of people here. 